Okay, let's continue. Um, we've just talked about the shortcomings of value at risk and expected shortfall. And one shortcoming and one problem associated with expected shortfall is that it is hard and difficult to backtest value uh, shortfall, uh, expected shortfall. Okay. Now, um, if we say that expected shortfall is difficult to backtest, we have to uh, get uh, to know what backtesting is actually about. <laughs> backtesting is and can be defined as a quality assessment process of a model, of a risk model, which is based on historical data. In, in the case of VAR backtesting, the estimated VARs are compared with the actual realized losses. So you, um, I'll show this on another slide, but what you do is you take um, the realized actual losses and for each period and for each point in your time, you compare the actual losses with the estimates of the value at risk. And then, just like with Deutsche Bank, we've seen before, you can um, try to identify the days or the month or the quarters in which the VAR was exceeded. And then you have VAR exceedances, and if you have too many or too little VAR exceedances, your risk model is no good. Okay. There are um, Several standard tests for VARBAC testing, especially the christopherson pelletier test and the Kupitz test. And the basic idea is that actually you compare those actual returns. And if you see that you have a exceedance here, um, you just say, OK, this is a 1, here's a 0. And then you have the set um, of ones and zeros, and you perform a statistical test on the randomness and on the correct number of ones in this sequence. We'll see this in just a bit, uh, but let's uh, first of all continue with some strand standard procedures for VAR calculation. <coughs> now, one has to be, um, or how should I put it? Um, if you were to take uh, a standard German textbook on banking, finance, uh, and risk management even, the things I've shown you today would probably be, I would say, 20-30%. Those textbooks would go on and on and on about value at risk and how to calculate VAR. And those three famous standard procedures, in fact, these are very simple uh, procedures, and I will just spend uh, less than 10 slides on that, because actually it's quite simple. The first is the variance-covariance method. It's also sometimes referred to as the delta normal method, and in one word, or two words, normal distribution. You simply assume losses to be normally distributed, and in this case, if x t plus 1 is multivariate normal, uh, normal distributed, you have uh, as parameters the expected uh, values and the variance covariance matrix, hence the name variance covariance uh, method. And we know that if we linearize losses, if we assume a normal distribution, it's actually quite simple to get the distribution of the portfolio losses. And in this case, we have this linear structure and for a normal distribution the value at risk is known analytically by here you can see this uh, in the multivariate case we've seen this before um, it's mu plus sigma times the uh, standard normal distribution quantile and in the multivariate case you get this you don't really need to remember this, but you only need to remember that in the variance-covariance method, the critical and only assumption is that losses are normally distributed. And if you make this assumption together with the uh, assumption of linearized losses, this means that the VAR estimation can be done on a sheet of paper. You simply need to know the expected value, you need to know the variance or volatility, and you need the quantile of a standard normal distribution, and then it's just mu plus sigma times z 
or in the multivariate case, it's slightly less, uh, slightly more complicated, but still, uh, it's known analytically. Yeah, this is the variance covariance method, and in the end, you get here a multivariate normal distribution, and this is quite simple, in fact. Um, you can have a look at this at home. Again, the variance covariance method is just another word for assuming a normal distribution. Now, how would you implement this practically? You need a, um, a sample and you need uh, to estimate the variances and covariances and expected values from this sample. So you take the unconditional loss distribution. If you take a conditional one, you need uh, to model xt plus 1 in this fashion. And then you have conditional expected values and conditional uh, variance covariance matrices. But in the end, you just take the data, estimate mu, estimate uh, the volatilities, and then insert it into uh, this function here. And you get the forecasted linearized losses. Quite simple. On the plus side, it gives you an analytical representation of the value risk. You know if you... Mm, look at this uh, like this. If you make the assumption of a normal distribution and this assumption is right, then the VAR estimate will be exact. It will be correct. Why? Because for a normal distribution, the quantiles are known exactly. They are known analytically. Mu plus sigma times the z quantile. But if this assumption is off, if it's not correct, then the analytical representation of the VAR doesn't help you much. It means you're, you're using the correct formula for the determination and estimation of the quantile on the incorrectly chosen distribution. So the, on the plus side, you have an analytical estimation of VAR and ES. On the negative side, uh, you have to linearize losses. You have to assume normally distributed risk factors, highly improbable in practice. And another, exam another advantage is that this general procedure can, of course, be extended to other types of distributions. You can take a t-distribution, you can take an um, extreme value distribution. Um, the idea is still the same. You simply assume a parametric form for your distribution. This is the first one. The second, yeah? Uh, when, you find, when you want to find out the, the real uh, form of the distribution, Will there ever be enough data to say, well, now we found, now we found it, or is there some changes, or are there some changes in the market that change the distribution? First of all, in market risk management, you will usually have enough data. If you take daily returns, you will have a couple of hundred po data points at your disposal. If you go to high frequency trading, you have thousands and possibly millions of data points. So data is not a problem in market risk management. It's much more a problem in credit risk management. Next problem is even if you have enough data to model your distribution, there is no guarantee that this distribution will be stable over time. So even if you accurately model the distribution, based on this uh, set of data, it might be that the distribution of the law changes over time and you cannot forecast that. Mm -hmm. Okay, the second method is even more simple. Instead of taking a parametric distribution for L, you use the historical um, an empirical distribution function. And in this context, it's called historical simulation or HS. Historical simulation simply means that you take the empirical distribution function of the data and instead of using, for example, a normal distribution, you take the empirical distribution. So how do you do this? It's quite simple. You simply take, uh, well, um, it's not as simple as one model, I think. So what do we do? We begin with the construction of a data set of simulated historical losses. 
Now, what does this mean? We take historical observations for the risk factors. We calculate historical losses that have occurred in the past. <laughs> And then we construct the distribution. And you probably know this. If you were to take um, a dice, what would you do? You would simply simulate enough draws. You would simply, you know, how, how, should I, how should I describe it to you? Um, assume you have 10 points. 10 data points, 1, 1, 1, 2, 1, 2, 5, 6, 8, 10. You have 10 data points. This is your historical, these are your historical data. What you would do then is you would rank them. You would sort them. 1, 1, 1, 1, 2, 2, 5, 6, 8, 10. And then in this case, each point is equally probable, so you have probabilities 1 over 10, 1 over 10, 1 over 10, and so on. And if you're interested, for example, in the 20% VAR, which is very high, but it's a discrete example, you would simply make the cut here. And then another problem, for example, with the discrete random variables, it's not exact, so you would probably need this and this value, in this case, it's the same, so one is the bar. This is historical simulation, it's quite simple. You simply take the empirical distribution, and in case of such a discrete uh, data set, you simply sort it and at some point cut it off. Hmm? Um, one assumption is, of course, again, that the um, empirical distribution function is stable over time. An advantage is that it's very easy to implement. It's, uh, you have a dimension reduction because you are taking n, an n-dimensional vector of risk factors and you boil it down to just one dimensional data set of losses. The large, uh, the data set that is required to do a proper um, historical simulation needs to be quite large. You need a lot of data and it's exclusively unconditional. So there is not really a good way to do this conditional, uh, in a conditional way. And last but not least, we have Monte Carlo simulation. So Monte Carlo simulation is almost the same as historical simulation. What does Monte Carlo simulation does? Does everyone know what simulation comma distribution means? Can someone explain that to me? Now, in the usual setting in statistics, you have a data set, you have some kind of stochastic law governing, governing the random behavior that led to this data, and you want to find a model that explains this data set. But in simulation and in Monte Carlo simulation, you can do it the other way, it's the other way around. You take the model and you create data points that are being created subsequent and uh, yeah, subsequent to this particular model, this particular random behavior, and the stochastic law that governs this random behavior. And the best example is a dice. You can take a dice and you can throw the dice, and you get a six, you get a five, you get a six again, you get a three. So you get three simulated observations from a dice. What distribution is this? What should it be? Yeah? Evenly distributed? Yeah. It's called uniform distribution in English. It's uniformly distributed across the discrete set 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. And by the way, and in the discrete case, it looks like this. And so on. And the continuous case looks like this. In German, we also call this a Rechteckverteilung. Be careful. In German, uh, it's, it's, it's easy to, to mistake this with identical distributions. Uh, and in, in English, it's, it's a better word. Uniform means this. 
the probabilities are all equal. Identically distributed random variables mean they share the same distribution law. So you can have two random variables with two normal distributions and they are identically distributed in case they have the same distribution. In German, it's tricky because we say identisch und gleich verteilt. And gleich verteilt could also mean they have, you know, die haben die gleiche Verteilung. So be careful when talking about gleich Verteilung and identische Verteilung. Identical is identisch and gleich Verteilung is uniform. And it's harder to make this mistake in English. Okay. And what do you do in Monte Carlo simulation? You simply assume a certain distribution for the risk factors. Now the problem would be that, for example, if I were to say we have two risk factors, x1 and x2. x1 is a normal distribution with a mu and sigma, and x2 is a high chi squared, I don't know how you pronounce that in English, chi quadrat, uh, distribution with 15 degrees of freedom. Now, let's assume the losses are simply x1 plus x2 squared. So, so this is the risk mapping. What distribution does L have? No idea. If the function is nonlinear, if it's highly uncommon, no way to find out what distribution L has. At least analytically, one might try it, might work in this case. Let's mix in a square root and uh, maybe a Pareto distribution, and then there's no way you can get the analytical um, distribution of L. But what you can do is you can throw a dice, more or less, for x1, and you can throw a dice for x2, and then, then take those two data points, calculate L, and then you get a simulation of L. And this is what you do in Monte Carlo simulation. You take the risk factors, you make assumptions on the distribution of those risk factors. You don't care how complicated um, the risk mapping is. You simulate a lot of data points for all risk factors. You insert it into the loss operator. And then at the end, you get M independent observation values, X, T plus 1 going from 1 to M, M be 10,000, 100,000, 1 million. You don't simulate 10 or 100 observations. If you want to find out what the distribution of the dice is, you don't throw it five times, you throw it 1,000 times, and then you would see the probabilities to stabilize at 1 over 6, and so on. Is that clear? Take the risk factors. As make assumptions and the difference between the covariance, variance covariance method and the Monte Carlo simulation is that in the variance covariance method you assume normal distribution. With Monte Carlo simulation, you don't assume any particular distribution. You make you can make different assumptions on all those risk factors, and then you simulate and simulate and simulate until the computer boils and is heating up, and then you get those simulated losses, and then you calculate the value risk just by doing the same as in historical simulation. You use the empirical distribution function of those simulated losses. Advantage is you can choose any distribution model for xt plus 1. m should be very large, and it should be very accurate if the model is, uh, has a good fit. Problem is, it's quite computationally complex. You need a computer that calculates a lot, of, uh, that simulates a lot from very complex distributions. And for a simple portfolio, this is no problem. But as soon as you have financial derivatives in it, this could get very demanding computationally. OK. So this is Monte Carlo simulation. Again, if you take any textbook on risk management, especially the German ones, you will find 
huge chapters just on the variance, covariance matrix the method, um, historical simulation, and you can do, you, you can analyze this until all eternity, and you can show all the, the, the details, how to cal calculate a percentage bar, a dollar bar, how to sh uh, change the time horizon of the var in the covariance variance method, and so on and so on. And I think this is mostly due to the fact that most textbooks are written by management professors and not mathematicians. Because for a mathematician, this is very simple and explained in three sentences. Assume a normal distribution, take the empirical distribution <coughs> function, or do a Monte Carlo simulation with any type of uh, distributional assumption. That's it. Those are the three methods to calculate bar. Bar is a quantile, and if you want to calculate the quantile of the distribution, normal distribution, empirical distribution, or Monte Carlo simulation. So that's quite simple. OK. Now, if you don't have any questions concerning those standard methods of uh, calculating VAR, let's turn to backtesting and express testing, which is next in our program. We've talked a little bit about backtesting, and I want to at least tell you the very basics of backtesting, because this is the last step of measuring risk. You need to make sure that your risk estimates are accurate and that um, they actually measure risk. Okay. So, I've explained this enough, I think. Back tests and stress tests fulfill one important function. They are meant to uh, estimate and to test the accuracy of your risk models. And by using the results of those back tests, you try to improve on the model accuracy. If you find out that your model is accurate, you're fine. If you find out your model is inaccurate, you need to change something, and then you can try to improve on your model. And closely related to back tests are stress tests. Stress tests are similar to back tests in that you try to, um, you, you want to see how the model reacts, but in stress testing, you usually use extreme scenarios and you want to see what happens if, for example, risk factors uh, go wild. Okay. In sample versus out of sample forecasting. This is quite interesting and important. You can do, yeah? And if uh, one bank finds a well fitting model, for example, uh, for a problem, will it share its information with other banks or is it so competitive that they will share? They will even patent it. Um, interesting side note. I've I'm, right now, I'm looking more into patents, uh, especially with banks, because of all the fintech uh, search going on now. And I found it interesting that actually uh, there was an important uh, ruling in '98 uh, on State Street Bank, um, in which uh, I think may might have been the uh, U.S. Supreme Court. It ruled that. Um, a company can patent a business process, chef's process. And this was the very first time that you had a business process and a company successfully filing for a patent on a business process. And in fact, this was the starting point for banks trying to patent financial innovations, meaning types of bank accounts, financial derivatives, because before that, there was no possibility to get a patent on, for example, a certain type of option. Back then, State Street Bank changed that, and now banks are, and, and other companies as well, are able to patent business processes. And they do this, and of course, risk management is an important part of, of your business, and you can get, you can get this patented. Um, I would, if you're interested in this, go to the US Patent Office or the European Patent Office, and just look up the patents that are being filed by, for example, um, Deutsche Bank um, or Bank of America, Citigroup, the larger ones. They have uh, a lot of patents on all types of processes. And most of them are related to trading algorithms, um, but many times also credit risk um, processes. 
for example, new methods with which they can assess the default probability of a credit and loan applicant and uh, to automatically decide on the application. So no, they will never change uh, and share that. In some cases, they might if it's well known. It may, might be the case, but usually no. However, they will, of course, this is one or uh, possibly yeah, one of the most important parts of the bank that will be audited by supervisors. If BaFin and the European Central Bank and Deutsche Bundesbank go to a local Sparkasse or to Deutsche Bank Commerzbank, this is something they will have a very close look at, the back tests and the back testing results. Why? They don't, they, they are not, uh, how should I put it? Um, they cannot tell the banks how to do their business. If Deutsche Bank wants to risk all their money in a single gamble, they might do so. It's, it's, it's an open market and, and we're a free economy. But they want the bank to have proper risk management processes and a proper risk management system in place. And the best way to test whether this risk management system is in proper shape is to do back and uh, stress testing. And this is why, first of all, um, the supervisors will audit those back testing procedures. And they will perform their own back tests. And if they do it on a macro level, they will do stress testing. This is why it's done by the European Central Bank and by, for example, Bundesbank. Okay. Now, when it comes to backtesting, we have to distinguish between in-sample and out-of-sample forecasting. What does this mean? First of all, let's be clear about the word estimation. Schätzung in German. Estimation means um, we, we take the model to the data and we calibrate the model using all the data that is available and we hope that our parameters are calibrated in such a way that the data fits, the model fits the data best. First example, we have an hypothesis. The age of the student in the lecture hall is normally distributed. We collect the data and we get a mean estimate of 21.4 and a standard deviation of 1.28. Then the estimated model with the assumption that it's normally distributed is 21.4, 1.8. Second example, let's assume we want to do a regression analysis. You might have wondered why this slide is empty. It's empty because I need some space to plot something. You all know this from your introduction to statistics. Basic linear regression means you put a line into this cloud of points. Now, you can assess the accuracy of your regression model by looking at the residuals. And hopefully this model is the best fitting one, meaning that the squared sum of residuals is minimum. Now this is in sample estimation and more or less also in sample, in sample forecasting accuracy. Yeah. You are using this data, all the data points are known to the model and you are looking at the accuracy in sample. What you can do now is, in contrast, you can do forecasting. In German that's Prognose. Under the forecasting of a statistical model we understand the projection of the values estimated by the model into the future using previously estimated parameters. First example, we simulate a random number from this normal distribution as a forecast of the age of a new student that comes to the lecture hall. So the next one probably quite improbable that someone will enter the lecture hall at this hour. But let's assume we simulate from this normal distribution. It should be, let's say, 23.8. So almost close to 24. 23.8. The next person that enters the room we ask him or her, what is your age? Then it's 22. Okay, our estimate, our forecast is off. And this is also how we would do out of sample backtesting. 
We simulate, we make a forecast. The forecast is 23.8. And then someone else comes in and we compare the actual value with the forecast value. And let's assume 20 people enter the room. We simulate 20 estimates and 20 forecasts. Then we have to compare 20 actual estimates with 20 forecasted ages. Again, same can be done in regression. You simply take this, you estimate the regression, and then, of course, forecasting means projecting the line into the future, and then we have to compare this with some actual values we can observe in reality. Now, in this setting, one would think that how can you backtest? You can only backtest in hindsight after a long time. Yes and no. Backtesting is, of course, only possible in hindsight. So we know what hindsight means? What do we In hindsight. Meaning that you cannot act, uh, you cannot assess the accuracy of your risk model in real time. Right? You, again, with the model of the next student coming in, if we are using all the data in here, and someone enters the room, we need to wait for this person to enter the room to compare our forecast with the next value. In risk management, that would mean we have to wait another day and another day uh, for actual returns to realize. But, however, we can do one simple trick that enables us to do this out-of-sample forecasting even today with a better accuracy. We don't have to wait so long. What can we do? We simply take all those persons on this side, we estimate the model with only a subset of the available data, and we leave the left-hand side out, we estimate the model, and then we compare our forecasts. We, need, we still need to simulate from this model. And we compare the forecasts from this model with the ones with the real data points we still have left. And this is out of sample forecasting. Because it seems weird. Out of sample? How can be something known that is out of sample if it's not in the sample? Well, it is in the sample. But we simply divide our available data points into an in sample and a hypothetical out of sample. So you just play dumb and you assume that you've forgotten that there is one uh, person sitting here as well. And what you can do when you have this data, for example, from 2000 to 2018, you can simply use the data up until 2017 estimate the model and then do an out of sample forecasting for 2017. And then you can today use all available data and assess the accuracy of your model out of sample. <coughs> now, when it comes to any risk model, in sample fit is, should always be good. That is, if we take a model to this data, an in sample, and we estimate the parameters. If we don't get a good fit here, it means our model is crap. It means that our model is not even able to assess and to forecast in sample, meaning we have the wrong model. In many cases, however, out of sample forecasting is a bit of luck. Again, under the assumption that the, um, uh, that the distribution is stable, we could assume that the out-of-sample forecasting should also be accurate. However, if anything changes, and we don't know about this because, well, it's in the future, at least in the hypothetical future, anything could happen. So out-of-sample forecasting, in the end, comes is equal to forecasting tomorrow's lottery numbers. And no statistical model can ac really accurately do this. You will always try to find a good 
um, a model that is good in, uh, has a good out of sample forecasting accuracy. But remember, if a model is good in forecasting out of sample, it might simply mean that um, it is well suited uh, to account for the particular properties of the data and assuming that the distributional law hasn't changed that much. That is why, for example, in time series analysis, you will always, almost always stick to a one day ahead forecast, or maybe a 10 or a five day ahead forecast. But um, as longer as the out of sample period gets, the more inaccurate your out of sample forecasting will be. And I still remember colleagues from a North, I'm not telling the university because otherwise everyone would know about him. Uh, there were, were people from a North German uh, university uh, showing the results or the ideas for a PhD thesis. For a PhD thesis. And they had the idea of using statistical models to forecast the S&P 500 10 years into the future. And I sat next to my PhD advisor and I said to him, well, if this works, we should invest. Because if I am able to out of sample forecast the S&P 500 returns <laughs> 10 years into the future. This is statistical. This is this is this is nonsense, right? Uh, no one knows about if Trump if Trump tomorrow pushes the red button, there will be no S&P 500. Hmm? So anything uh, anything beyond maybe a one or a five day ahead forecast when it comes to daily stock returns is nonsensical. Okay. This is out of sample forecasting. And under the in sample, we understand the data used for the estimation. If a part, usually the most current part of the data, is not used for estimation and instead forecast values are used for quality control of the models, these are referred to as the out of sample. OK. Well, I have one slide left. I don't need this. And you know now know about in sample and out of sample forecasting accuracy, and let's turn to back testing. I've already told you the basic ingredients we need. You take the actual losses, you take the VAR estimates, you compare those two, and if these are the actual losses, and this is the VAR, very simple constant VAR, you have one exceedance and a second exceedance. So we have zero, one, zero, 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 one, zero, 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 zero. And you can read about this on the slides, and I'll uh, do a short cut here because I think uh, every one of you wants to go home as it's quite late. How do these tests work? They t usually test two properties. The first one is the correct number. If we have 100 days and the 10% VAR, 10 observations should be below and 90 should be above the VAR. So you simply add those ones, you calculate the number of VAR exceedances, and you do a formal statistical test <coughs> of the correct number of VAR exceedances. In this simple example, it's quite, quite clear. 100 days, 10% VAR, means 10 exceedances. If you have 18, if you have 2, the statistical test might tell you reject them all. If you have 11, it should, could be OK statistically. The second property that is important is what? And quite realistic. Let's assume you have something like this. Then it would look like this. And so on. You have clustering or system. You could also have something that is also interesting. You could have something like this. You have a clustering of VAR exceedances or you have systematic changes. Both are considered to be non-random. And 
you probably haven't seen this. I still remember this in my uh, statistics lecture almost 20 years ago. Um, there was something called a random test. No, it was, yeah, how was it called? Hips test. I think it's called Hips test. Uh, what does it mean? You have um, a data set like this, consisting of ones and zeros, and you want to test whether this is random. And how can you measure and how can you test randomness? By looking at the two extremes. One extreme is 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, you have clustered. <coughs> and the other extreme scenario is systematic changes. 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0. And in fact, you can test this here as well. You want those exceedances to be independent over time. You don't want clustering. And those back tests, those famous back tests, they test both properties. The Kupitz test back from the 90s, Kupitz, Paul Kupitz was a, I think he is still um, a, an employee at the FDIC in the United States. The test simply adds the ones and does a test of the correct number of like sequences. Then you have the test of Christofferson, later on Christofferson Pelletier, and they combine it with a joint test of the correct number and no clustering. <coughs> and the test, uh, the model is rejected if you either have too many or too little exceedances, or if you have clusters. And that's back testing. Compare those actual losses with those estimates and those forecasts. How could you do it? You take an historical data set, for example, 500 trading days. You split it up into a trading data set and an out of sample. And you can use moving windows. And, and then you can assess the quality with such a back test. These are formal statistical tests. So you get a p-value and you get a test uh, decision, reject or not reject the model and on the basis of the found results. And if you found, for example, that the number is correct, but you have um, exceedance clusters, you need to improve on the model, or you need to correct it. This is also required uh, by supervisors. For example, if you take a look at paragraph 318 uh, of the German solvency uh, um, executive order, it requires that the forecasting quality of a risk model has to be determined using a daily comparison of the potential risk amount calculated on the basis of a holding period of one week. And you can see they give you the details of how the back test should be done. But the Solvabilitätsverordnung that is relevant for all financial institutions in Germany requires that you do back testing. It's not just nice for you because it improves your business, but it's required by supervisors. The correct number of Weigen sequences is called unconditional coverage. If your model has unconditional coverage, it means the number is correct. If it has conditional coverage, it means also it's independent. The Weigen sequences are independent over time. And you can, be, you can think about that when it comes to the correct number, both extremes are undesirable, undesirable for a risk manager. First of all, if the number of VARC sequences is too high, this means that you are too risky. You have far too many VARC sequences and your risk is far, too, far higher than your VARC estimates tell you. But it's also no option to simply say, oh, let's be very conservative, let's just put the VAR down here, because you are spending too much risk capital. You could use the capital uh, and uh, put it to a better use. So in this case, the model is also inaccurate. So this is the condition that is being tested, share of expected violations, excess coverage level alpha, um, expected violations, exceedances, it's the same. Okay, and these are called tests of unconditional coverage, and this is one test. Let Zt be random, a real random variables, and var be the value at risk at excess coverage level alpha. Then this function h is called the hit function. That's why it's called h, h for hit. Alternatively, 
You can also define the hits via the losses that exceed a bar threshold. You can see that here it is defined by Zt less or equal than minus var. Again, if you take a P and L or an L distribution, uh, you have to change the inequation. And the hypothesis to be tested now is expected value of Ht minus alpha under conditional on the information set up to, until t minus 1 being available is zero. That means the expected mean, the expected value is alpha. 10% var, 10% var exceedances. Quite simple. This is the Kubitz test. This is the test statistic. You take the hits minus alpha, you sum it up across your sample, divided by square root of n, and then the test statistic follows, I think, a chi-squared assumption. Yeah? And yeah, no, it's actually, no, this one follows a normal, standard normal distribution. Okay. If you are ever in need of such a backtest, just look it up in the paper. Uh, it should be implemented in R, it should be implemented in MATLAB. Uh, you can find it anywhere. You can even do it yourself. Just simply take those ones, add it up, calculate the test statistic, and you can use the standard normal distribution that's probably on your calculator. So this is very simple. In practice, you need to estimate this from a data sample, and it only gives you, of course, the test of unconditional coverage. The test for conditional coverage, for example, by Christophers and Pelletier, is a test of the hypothesis that the set of hits is IID, that is especially independently distributed over time, which means that a cluster of hits would violate this IID assumption. By the way, some colleagues of mine from back from Dortmund University and I, we also developed a back test that was published in the Journal of Banking and Finance that is slightly better than the Christophers and Pelletier test when it comes to the test of this IID assumption. You know, because usually the Christophers and Pelletier test only tests one of the I's. It doesn't, it only tests the independent, it doesn't test the identical distribution property. We have a slightly, a slight variant of this test. Now, what do we need? You can look at this at home. Um, I want to give you a basic idea of how the test works. It looks at the auto covariance function of the hits, and what does it do? It looks at the sequences of hits that follow each other. You simply count the number of times a one is followed by a zero, the number of times a zero is followed by a one, and the number of times a zero is followed by a zero, and the number of times a one is followed by a one. And then you get a two times two matrix. So, zero, zero, um, one, one, zero, one, uh, one, zero. And you count the numbers, a one is followed by a zero, and so on. So actually, you look at the autocovariance function at like one, I think. And then you get this Leon box test uh, on the autocovariance or correlation. And in case you don't have a cluster, this Auto covariance will be zero or close to zero. And if it is too high, um, you will reject the independently distributed hits, the hypothesis. Mm -hmm. And this is, it looks a little bit difficult, but actually the test is quite simple. You, we don't need to show the asymptotics of the test statistics, we simply have to accept it. And this test is quite, quite simple. And this one is from 2008. There's another one by Christophers and Pelletier from 2004. Actually, this is the one. And this, of course, only looks at the legs at one. And here you can take higher legs. So you're not looking at the legs one period behind you, but you're looking at the exceedances two periods back, three periods back, and you can see the different leg. 
Okay. So, this is from one of our papers. Um, this is um, a plot from a paper, and you can see some VAR estimates with real data, different models, and uh, in red, uh, with the red lines, you can see the VAR exceedances. So there are some models that perform quite well. Uh, in this case, this is very conservative. You can see here you have some um, VAR exceedances in the middle and at the bottom, and one then has to test whether these exceedances are in fact independent over time and if they have the correct number. Yeah. I think actually it's the same model, just a different type of estimation window used. So in this one, we have a fixed window. Uh, this one is rolling. And this is recursive. I think it is. It is. It gets larger. Might be. I'll look in the paper. Okay. Any questions concerning back testing? The idea is quite simple, and actually the tests are as well. I don't think there is much research going on in back testing these days. Most back tests work quite well, and the question now is how to back test expected shortfall. With expected shortfall, you have the same setting, but much less data, and this makes it quite difficult to backtest expected shortfall. Okay. Stress testing is also um, quite simple. What you do in stress testing is, it's a process in which you assume extreme or crisis scenarios, and you examine the effect on individual companies, for example, banks. So you can check, for example, the accuracy of a particular risk model, but you can also, in macro stress tests, test the resilience of the whole financial sector. And this is what the European Central Bank has done a couple of times now. So what you do is, you start with a scenario analysis, and you come up with an extreme scenario that should put a lot of stress on your company, on individual banks, or the whole financial sector. For example, um, interest rates drop to minus 2%. Unemployment rate increases to 18%. This is an extreme scenario, and then you look at your model and you try to figure out what happens with your company or with your sector in case of this, um, in case of this extreme scenario. Now, we can distinguish between micro-stress tests in a micro stress test, you try, as a company, you try to um, isolate and identify those effects on your company. In macro stress tests, for example, BaFin or the European Central Bank, they do stress testing for systemic reasons. They want to analyze the stability of the whole sector, and these are macro stress tests, and they are, of course, usually done by central banks. Okay. This is a constructed and very simple example of a stress test. What could you do? For example, uh, you have a company and you know that the expected loss and the variance of the losses, they are a function of the GDP growth, the unemployment rate, um, and then you do um, a scenario for the unemployment rate and the interest rate level, and in this case, the unemployment rate and the GDP growth and then you, you just insert it. You come up with a potential loss under this extreme scenario. And I have to admit, this is, very, this is a very trivial example, but it should give you an idea of what you would do. You would need to come up with a model for your losses, micro level or macro level. Then you have to assume an extreme scenario, insert it into the function, and then you know what could happen. So, for example, you assume that unemployment rate rises to 15%, simultaneous collapse of the entire economy, and then the expected loss would amount to 4.05 million euros. <coughs> hmm? Okay, so this, again, this is very simple. This is stress testing. You, uh, some companies do this um, in risk management. Not many, but some do it. I would assume it makes the most sense in operational risk management. 
For example, assume what would happen if all IT systems would go down tomorrow and they would stay down for a month. This is an extreme scenario and then you can do some stress testing because you don't need this for some minor asset portfolios or some small investments uh, you do on a regular basis. You don't need stress testing for this. But it would be interesting, for example, banks probably have done a stress test scenario for Brexit. As soon as the Brexit vote came in, I'm pretty sure all banks went to the risk management departments and told them, okay, tell us what are the potential consequences of a hard Brexit. This, this is probably what has been done in banks. Stress testing usually is related and associated with macro stress tests. And the most famous ones are the EU bank stress tests. This and these stress tests have been performed by the European system of central banks, more precisely uh, the European Banking Authority and the European Central Bank. And this, does everyone know what the European Banking, Ethos, uh, Banking Authority is? The EBA, EBA. It actually is not one single institution, it's it's the term with which we refer to especially the single supervisory mechanism, the SSM. The fact that large, systemically relevant banks in Europe, in the Eurozone, are now supervised by the European Central Bank. And the single resolution mechanism, uh, the system in place for large systemic banks in case one of them defaults, so that they can be resolved and um, yeah, they can be resolved um, in an organized fashion within the European Union. So the European, the single supervisory mechanism, the SSM and the SRM, the single resolution mechanism, those are the two parts of the European banking authority that form the EBA. It was intended uh, for the EBA to also include a single European, uh, Europe-wide deposit insurance mechanism. But I would rather leave this out because, uh, as you might know, Germany successfully prevented this from being installed in Europe. It was intended to be, the EBA was intended to be a three-pillar system, single resolution, supervision, and deposit insurance, but deposit insurance is not currently part of the EBA. Okay. So these are some details of the EU-wide bank stress test done in 2014. There has been one in 2016 and one in 2018. You can go to the website of the European Banking Authority and review the results. They are published publicly on the website. And here you can see the idea was to assume an economic slump, an extreme scenario, and test the resilience of the Europe large European banks. And in 2014, uh, 128 banks and banking groups were included in this, 24 from Germany. And the first uh, thing they did was a so-called AQR, the Asset Quality Review. They reviewed all the assets the banks held, and they looked at the question, how much, by how much would the value of these assets decrease in case of an extreme adverse market scenario? And then they conducted a stress test. <laughs> So it was carried out in cooperation between the EBA, the National Supervisory Authorities, European Central Bank, during the stress test, the examined banks had to show how resilient their equity is, how their common equity tier one capital is. And as you might remember, a few banks failed this stress test, and I think it might have been 2016 or 2014, for example, in Italy, um, um, I don't know the exact uh, name, uh, Banca uh, uh, Monte di Paschi uh, failed. And as you might know, Monte di Paschi is uh, the most critical bank in Italy right now because it's 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 supposedly close to de default uh, from time to time. Um, there were some banks that failed, there were no big surprises, and um, this will be very interesting in the near future for research. Why? 
My personal uh, idea is, and my personal impression is, that these types of stress tests are, not my impression, actually I know this, uh, these stress tests are highly political. Uh, I can give you a couple of examples. First of all, I still remember colleagues from the central bank uh, saying exact quote, oh, we still have to work on this, the results are not as expected. I mean, um, in this type of stress test, one, would, one needs to think about the potential outcome. What, what, is, what does the supervisor, what does the central bank want to achieve? First extreme scenario, the stress test, uh, the, the result of the stress <coughs> test is everything's fine. All the banks have high capital and they have enough capital to even take on more risks. No politician will ever accept this result. If they do a stress test, they need to tell banks, come on, be careful. So there will never be the result that everything's okay. But what would happen if the European Central Bank had published, well, out of the 128 banks we tested, 125 would immediately fail in case of a mildly adverse scenario. This would signal the markets that those banks are free to fall, and they would immediately step in and force those banks down. Now, a stress test, an official stress test, will never have the result that the situation is dire. So, one will always, one can always make a prediction what the result will be. Everything's fine right now, but we still need to be very, very careful. So. If you ever hear the results of such a stress test, it will almost always sound like this. It's okay, but not great. Even worse, in insurance. The insurance, the International Association of Insurance Supervisors, the IAIS, the uh, organization that is uh, part of the Bank for International Settlements in Basel and comparable to the Basel Committee in Basel, um, the IAIS started to do this in insurance a couple of years ago, and they tried to, um, uh, to identify the globally systemically important insurers. Just like the Financial Stability Board identified globally systemically important banks or financial institutions, so-called CIFIs, systemically important financial institutions. And, and in meetings, that in, in private meetings with the executives and the supervisors, People agreed, for example, that in this list, there was one insurance company, Ping An, uh, the largest Chinese insurance company. Uh, it was included as systemically important, but did you, do you know why it was included? Because a large economy like China has the right to its own systemically important insurance company. It was a matter of prestige. China, as a um, a large economy, it could not be that China does not have a systemically important insurer. Everyone has one. So it was not about the actual effect, it was much about politics and, and prestige even. So this is even more ridiculous than the European uh, stress test here in banking. You can see some of the scenarios, base scenario, adverse scenario, GDP growth decreased by 1.5% and so on. And the European Systemic Risk Board uh, developed these and other indicators uniformly for all banks. And then they set a CET1 capital ratio for those banks. And you can read about the details later on. I mean, you get the idea. It is probably more interesting to go to, let me just see somewhere. I have the link here. If you click here, you will get to the link at the here. Now the results were published in July 2016, and now you have some additional <coughs> results. And here you can see some losers. Monte de Pasqua de Siena, yeah. National, uh, National Bank of Greece, Nova Creditna, Bank Maribor. You can see uh, Dexha. This is probably the largest one in this bank stress test. But you can see there was no big surprise, like for example, Commerzbank, Deutsche Bank, BNP Paribas, or another large European bank. All those were 
more or less known before, and even a couple of Greek banks. Yeah. And this is the stress test in 2016. At first scenario depicts four systemic risk factors, global risk premium, weak profitability, increasing debts of sustainable corporations, future stress in rapidly growing shadow banking sector. Um, you can come up with your own type of stress test and European, the European Central Bank has even improved on that again for the next stress test. And you can see, for example, these are the participating German banks. Those are the large ones, actually. And yeah, that's all I want to tell you about stress testing. It's, uh, it's a minor topic. It's more relevant, I guess, in banking, but it's highly relevant for the large banks right now, because as you might imagine, if you uh, fail those stress tests, you will be uh, punished by supervisors and they will have a closer look at your business. And if you are identified as a systemically important insurance, and especially also if you fail the stress test, banks might be forced to increase their capital. And this is what happened a couple of years ago. Um, the European Banking Authority increased mandatory capital requirements for banks, and some banks had to raise capital or they have to decrease, decrease lending. Mm -hmm. Okay, so any questions concerning backtesting or stress testing? Okay, if not, thank you for your attention and have a great evening. Thank you.